Hi, welcome back. You know why I enjoyed valuing companies so much? Because each company is so unique. For those of you who track my sessions, just a couple of weeks ago, I valued Instacart, the online grocery app company for an IPO. Today, I want to value another company, and this company is very different in almost every dimension than Instacart. It's Birkenstock. Different in what way? Instacart is a young company, about a decade old, no, Birkenstock is 250 years old. Instacart is an app, but it's an intermediary. Birkenstock makes sandals and shoes, which are described either as very ugly or like walking on clouds, depending on who you talk to. So as I go into this IPO valuation, I want to use it as a vehicle to talk about something that accountants are obsessed with right now, but don't really have a handle on, which is intangibles. So I want to value Birkenstock, but I also want to value the intangibles in Birkenstock. And boy, does Birkenstock have a bunch of different intangibles. So let's set the process up. Now intangibles, of course, are any assets you cannot see. And accountants historically have not done a very good job in valuing intangibles and bringing them onto balance sheets. And we'll talk about why. As the economy has transitioned from a 20th century economy centered around manufacturing companies to one centered around technology and service companies, that sin of not dealing with intangibles is becoming more visible. As a consequence, there's a huge amount of debate going on in accounting on how to bring intangibles onto balance sheets and what effect this will have on accounting statements. Now, I'm going to tell you up front that I think the accounting, I don't quite understand the accounting obsession with intangibles. You're saying, that's strange. I mean, your, your, your interest of valuation, isn't this a big issue? I've never thought about intangibles as separate from any other assets. And we'll talk about why in an intrinsic value world, intangibles don't have the kind of central role that they do in accounting. So let's set the historical perspective on intangibles. I mean, let's act, not act like intangibles were invented in the 21st century. As long as there have been markets and companies, intangibles have been part of valuation. That analysts or investor who valued GM in the 1920s, just after it had gone public, a young automobile company, probably attached a premium to GM because Alfred P. Sloan, one of the great CEOs of all time, headed the company, a visionary CEO. You can carry the thread through all the way through the 20th century. By the 1980s, if you're valuing GE, people were attaching a Jack Welch premium. At that time, he was viewed as a legendary CEO who had turned around a company, a mature company, and made it a growth company again. Even if you look at the Nifty 50, these are the 50 stocks that carried the market upwards in the late 60s and early 70s. And you take a look at who's on that list, you see companies that derive a big chunk of their value from intangibles. You have Coca-Cola, McDonald's, Gillette, all companies where there was a brand name component. You had Bristol Myers and Pfizer, pharmaceutical companies that derived the value from patents. IBM and Hewlett Packard for much of the early part of the 20, you know, from the 1950s, 60s, 70s, especially IBM, were technology companies that pioneered that space and were priced accordingly, therefore intangibles. What I'm trying to say is intangibles have always been part of investing in valuation. And many old time value investors, in fact, attach a great deal of value to intangibles. If you're in the Warren Buffett school, for instance, there's a big component to good management, though good is often fuzzy, good management. Moats, competitive advantages, things you can't see, but clearly add value. So intangibles have always been part of value. So you're saying, why the sudden waking up? Why the sudden debate? It's a question of magnitude. As we've gone through time, the proportion of value that comes from intangibles has gone up. And the kinds of companies that dominate the market have become more intangible based. So to give you a sense of what I'm talking about, I've taken the 10 largest companies in terms of market cap at the start of every decade going back to 1980. Let's go back all the way to 1980. Number one company in the list was a company with intangibles, IBM. But if you look at the rest of the list, eight of the 10 were manufacturing or oil companies. Then you get to 1990 and you see what the Japanese boom of the 1980s did. You see a bunch of Japanese companies in the list, but again, financial service companies, manufacturing companies. Then you get the dot-com boom and you see technology rise to the top. But even in 2000, you had companies like GE, 
and Walmart on the list. Companies that were not exactly companies, but intangibles were a big driver of value. Then you get to 2010 and 2020, you can start to see the shift. And especially as you get to 2020 and 2023, you see the companies that dominate the list are the big tech companies. You take any of these companies, Apple, Microsoft, Alphabet, Amazon, and you say, where does the value come from? For each of them, it comes from something intangible. With Apple, it could be from the operating system, from the styling. The smartphone itself is kind of a side story. For Microsoft, it's Windows, Office, the cloud business. Most of these companies derive the bulk of their value from intangible assets. Put simply, if you've been avoiding or ignoring intangible assets, you can no longer do it because the largest, most valuable companies in the world derive their value from intangibles. And here's the second reason. Prior to the 1990s, when companies went public, they went, with, they went public with fairly well-formed business models. What does that mean? They were either already making money or on the verge of making money. If you get a chance, go back and take a look at Apple and Microsoft's prospectuses. These weren't money-losing companies. They were money-making companies. They had a gro huge growth potential, but they were money-making companies. That's changed over the last 30 years. It started, of course, with the dot-com boom, when companies bypassed venture capitalism and went public with very little revenues, big losses, and lots of potential. And that's continued. In fact, the percentage of money losing companies is now at the end, at the end, by the time you get to 2020, is down to almost where it was during the dot com boom. More and more companies are going public without existing assets deriving value, driving profits, but with a lot of growth potential. You think, so what? When you value a company, and one of the, my favorite metrics or, or, or or structures to think about value is to think about the where the value of a company comes from. Some of it comes from investments you've already made. I call it assets in place. Some of it comes from expected future growth. What we have in these companies that are going public right now is whether you like them or not, the bulk of their value comes from expected future growth. You think, so what? When, you've, when you're asked to value investments you've already made, you can draw on cash flows and earnings and financial statements, tangible things that drive value. But think about how you value growth assets. They're based on expectations, perceptions. In other words, you're valuing things you can't see right now. Welcome to the new world order. Companies that are the largest companies right now derive much of the value from intangibles. Companies going public, much of the value comes from growth assets that you can't see. Intangibles have risen to the top of the pile in terms of issues we have to deal with. So now let's turn to why accountants are so obsessed with intangibles. I'm not an accountant and I'm not going to try to psychoanalyze them. But you've all seen the accounting statements, right? There's the income statement, the balance sheet, and the statement of cash flows, the three big financial statements. And accountants, in my view, are unduly attached to balance sheets. You know what? Accountants operate under the delusion that balance sheets actually give you a sense of the value of a company. In theory, a balance sheet shows you what you own, the assets you have, what you owe and the equity in the company. The book value of equity is the accountant's entry into that contest of what the value of the company is. So when you look at an accounting balance sheet, you've got assets broken down into fixed assets, current assets, financial investments, and of course, this big category of intangible assets. Now, let's take intangible assets and set them to the side because, as I said, accountants are still struggling with it. The rules that accountants use to put a number on each of the other asset categories is fairly clear, but it's internally inconsistent. What does that mean? If I buy land, building, equipment, machinery, that, co that cost, what I originally paid, becomes the basis for what you see on the balance sheet, net of any depreciation or amortization on it. If I have current assets, inventory, receivables, it's usually at current values because I didn't buy that inventory 10 years ago. Cash and marketable securities, easiest of all, it's what it is worth today. If I have investments in other companies, all bets are off. It depends on how it's recorded. If I hold it for trading, and that's an accounting term, I have to mark to market. If I hold it as a strategic investment, I can show it at what I originally paid for it. 
So even with those asset groups where accountants claim to have a handle on things, they're all over the place. He's saying, what about intangibles? For the longest time, there were no intangibles on the balance sheet. There was one, but it was actually an intangible only name, and I'll come in and fill in the blanks on that. Accountants now recognize when you look at these companies, the bulk of the value comes from intangibles, that they have to figure out a way to bring intangibles onto the balance sheet. And it's going to have consequences, right? And here's why. A balance sheet has to balance. If I decide to bring intangibles like brand name and patents and technological expertise and customer lists onto the balance sheet as an asset, for the balance sheet to balance, my stockholders' equity or shareholders' equity has to go up. Whatever I do to intangibles is going to have consequential impact on my book value of equity. So the accounting debate has been joined, but accountants have a problem, and it's a problem of their own making. There's a reason why intangibles don't show up on the balance sheet. It's not because you cannot see the asset. It's because how they're recorded in the financial statements. Let's step back. Why do plant and equipment show up on your balance sheet? It's a simple reason, right? When you buy a new, fa when you build a new factory or you buy equipment, it's treated as a capital expenditure. Accountants don't show that expense in your income statement. They show it in the statement of cash flows, but they show only that portion of the expense that they think is attributable to this year's operations in your income statement as an expense. That's a depreciation or amortization. It's the unamortized portion of that expense that shows up on the balance sheet. You think so what? Well, guess what accountants do with the expenses that create intangible assets? How do you get brand name? You spend a lot of money on brand adver advertising, right? What do accountants do with brand advertising? They expense the whole thing. How do you build up a technological edge? By investing in R&D. What do accountants do with R&D? Screw it up big time. They expense the whole thing again. I know they have excuses. It's a conservative thing to do, but there's a consequence. When you expense R&D and exploration costs and what you spend on training and recruiting human capital, by definition, because you're expensing it, it will not show up in the balance sheet. Now do you see, in spite of all of the talk about bringing intangibles on the books, why accountants are finding it more so difficult to move because to bring these intangible assets in the balance sheet, you have to redo how you do accounting. Your income statement will change, your balance sheet will change, and it's going to terrify companies and investors who are used to the way you've reported revenues and earnings and book value at these companies. Now, show you how slow the actual movement in accounting has been in bringing intangibles. I'm going to start with a graph that initially is going to look like an optimistic view of, hey, accountants are waking up, intangibles are now part of balance sheets. This is a graph that looks at book value of equity broken down into tangible book value. That's a red portion and the rest of book value. If you look at the percentage of book value, that's tangible book value. It's a physical plant, equipment, old time assets. It's gone down from more than 70% in 1998 to about 30% in 2020, 2022. You're saying, this is good. It means they must be bringing intangible assets onto the balance sheet. Good job, accountants. Well, before you make that judgment, let me show you a second graph. When you look at the actual intangible assets on accounting balance sheets, through time, since 1998, you can see that the most significant item on accounting balance sheets that, that's treated as intangible is Goodwill. I'll come back and curse Goodwill in a few minutes. But take a look at this graph on Goodwill. First, you're saying, why the jump in 2001? It's not because companies suddenly decided to do a lot more acquisitions, but there was an accounting rule change. Prior to 2001, if you did an acquisition and it classified as pooling, you didn't have to show Goodwill. 2001, that rule was changed. All acquisitions had to show Goodwill. Ever since, Goodwill has been 60% plus of all of the intangibles on accounting balance sheets. You think, so what? Goodwill is good? It isn't. In fact, it's not an asset at all, tangible or intangible. Goodwill is a plug variable. Think of why. For Goodwill to manifest itself on, its, on your balance sheet, what do you have to do? You have to acquire another company, 
And goodwill is the difference between what you pay for the company and its book value. I know you do a little dance on fairness book value, but it's really the difference between market value and book value. It's a plug variable. You know why goodwill exists, right? It exists for one reason and one reason alone. Your balance sheets have to balance. So in spite of all of the talk of intangibles, accountants are still playing games with goodwill. The intangibles that we think about as really significant, brand name, patents, technological expertise, great management is not in that is, is not on balance sheets yet. And here's another piece of evidence that accounting talk about, about intangibles outruns what they're actually doing. I broke down in 2022 companies in the all US companies into sectors. These are the S and P fires, the S and P sectors. With each one, I compare the market cap of the company to the book value of equity in the company. The gap is basically the difference between what the market thinks about the value of the equity in the company and the book, of, book value of equity. The sector where the numbers are closest tend to be financials and utilities. In financials, they're closed because everything gets marked up to market. In utilities, they're closed because there's not much growth. These, these are companies heavily into physical assets. Guess which sectors accountants have the most trouble with? One is technology, and you can see already that in technology, the book equity is vastly below the market cap. And the other, and, and if you look across, you can see with, even with industrials and healthcare, you have the same issues. Put simply, if accountants are doing such a great job bringing intangibles onto the balance sheet, these differences should exist. So if I were to summarize what the accounting debate and discussion about intangibles has led us to, first, it's been more talk than action. It's not translated into material changes on balance sheets, at least with GAAP. IFRS is a little further ahead, but the way they're bringing intangibles onto balance sheets is terrifyingly bad. And I think there's a reason accounting will never get its hands around intangibles. The tools, the techniques, the mindset you need to value intangibles and bring them onto the balance sheet is at odds with the accounting mindset. What I'm going to say next is not an insult, but it's, I think, a description of reality. The accounting mindset is mired in the past. It's based on looking at data in the past, and it's rule-driven. You don't believe me on rule-driven? Pick up a book on GAAP and IFRS and th first... You know, look at the number of rules accountants have on what you can or cannot do. It's rule-driven and backward-looking. And the skills you need to value intangibles is you need to be forward-looking and you need to be principle-driven. You need to be flexible. The skill set you need to value intangibles is imagination, and that doesn't come easily to accounting rule writers. It might come to accountants, but not to accounting rule writers. So with that long lead-in, let me talk about why I don't spend much time talking about intangibles separately. I'm often critiqued for not talking enough about intangibles. I'm asked, why don't you have a session in your valuation class about valuing intangibles? In my, I have four books on valuation, now soon to be five, and I'm often asked, you know, why don't you have a chapter on intangibles? Why don't you write a book on intangibles? And I don't see what I would say there. To me, there is really no difference between tangible and intangible when it comes to intrinsic valuation. I'm not being in denial. I don't have to create new models. I believe that the way we think about intrinsic value already includes intangibles. You need imagination, but you don't need to modify what you do. There, are no, there is no need for a separate valuation approach to intangibles. I know you don't believe me, but let me explain what I mean by this. Let's go back to Intrinsic Valuation 101. We know what drives intrinsic value, right? In intrinsic value, we say the value of an asset is the present value of the expected cash flows in the asset. We take expected cash flows over the life of the asset, discount them back at a risk-adjusted discount rate. And if you're valuing a company which potentially could last forever, the only thing you change is instead of estimating cash flows over the life of the company or estimated for a finite period. And at some point in time in the future, you stop and you assume cash flows grow at a constant rate, but it's still one equation. 
in my valuation class, that I start the class with what I call the it proposition. And forgive me if you heard this before. The it proposition is a very simple one. For anything, tangible or intangible, to affect value, for it to affect value, it has to affect either the expected cash flows or the risk through, uh, and the discount rate. If it doesn't affect either, then it has no effect on value. So here's what I'd like to do. I'd like to take that intrinsic valuation equation and flesh it out more in terms of tying it to business metrics. Now in my valuations, I try to keep my valuations parsimonious. My expected cash flows come from three operating metrics. My revenue growth, that captures the growth potential of the business. My profitability, captured by my operating margins, now and over time. And how efficiently I deliver growth. How much do I need to invest to get that growth? Revenue growth margins of investment efficiency. My risk-adjusted discount rate comes from raising money from equity and debt. Lenders assess risk based on default risk. Equity investors assess risk. If you're a publicly traded company, as risk added to a diversified portfolio. But the bottom line is my risk-adjusted discount rate reflects the risk of my operations augmented by any financial risk I've created by borrowing too much or too little. And a hidden secret, something we don't talk about much in an intrinsic valuation, is an intrinsic valuation is designed for a going concern. You're saying as opposed to what? It doesn't deal well with failure. If there is failure risk, either from you know, distress or from nationalization, you've got to bring it in almost explicitly to capture the effect of that risk. So let me restate the proposition. If any item, tangible or intangible, is going to affect value, it's got to show up in one of these six inputs. So let's take a few intangibles and look at the most likely places they will show up. Might not be the only one, but the most likely one. Start with brand name. What does a brand name give you? It gives you pricing power. It allows you to sell something very similar to what your competitors are selling at a much higher price. Where, where does pricing power show up? It shows up higher margins. Brand name companies should have higher margins. In some cases, you have a recognizable brand name. It could spill over into higher growth. And if you have a really recognizable brand name, you might be able to borrow money at a lower rate. Coca-Cola walks in an Atlanta bank the fact that their Coca-Cola might give them a lower cost of debt than they should be paying given their risk. But the primary input is margins. What if you have a visionary management, intangible, right? Or opportunistic. Now, remember a few months ago, I valued NVIDIA. And one of the things I pointed to was how impressive their opportunistic growth was. They managed to find big markets before they were big, got in ahead of others, and were well positioned to grow in those markets. If you have visionary management, I would expect to show up as higher revenue growth. An intangible we often don't talk about is connections to government. And I'll leave it at that. How do connections to government help? Well, if your connections to government help you win bids on contracts when you're bidding against other competitors, it shows up as revenue growth. If connections to government allow you to borrow money at below market rates, it gives you a lower cost of debt and a cost of capital. And connections to government might also mean that you're too big to fail, that if you're in risk, the government will come bail you out. One intangible is that you have a scalable business. What does that mean? That you can grow quickly with relatively little investment. The place it's going to show up is with much less reinvestment for the same amount of growth. I know this isn't a comprehensive list, but think about any intangible you've ever been said has value and think about where it's going to show up. And one of the things you're going to notice is this is a great way to separate true intangibles from the wannabes. And every company I ever talk to claims to have a brand name. You know, a very, very simple test of whether they actually have a brand name is look at their margins. If that company's margin is 7% and the industry average is 12%, my advice to the company is stop talking about a brand name. You don't have one anymore. You might have 10, 50, or 100 years ago, but it's not there anymore. It's also become my bullshit detector. When you see buzzwords being presented, and this is great for value, I pass it through this test of where does it show up and how does it affect value. If you read my posts on ESG when I started in 2019, I started as a, you know, because I was 
I was curious. I wanted to see where ESG showed up in value. And on item after item, my answer was, I don't see it here. I don't see it here. At the end of the process, I said, it doesn't show up anywhere. So why are we investing $11 trillion in acronym that really doesn't show up anywhere? Now, I'm not trying to gloss over the calculation details. It's true, it's easier to value a company with a single intangible. With Coca-Cola, let's face it, it's, it's brand name, brand name, and brand name. It's much more difficult when you have a company with multiple intangibles. A company like Apple, you've got brand name, you've got uh, styling, you've got an operating system, you've got a platform with 1.5 billion people on it. Big, you know, you can value the bundle of intangibles, but separating them becomes much more difficult. But I'll make a confession. When I invest in Apple, does it matter to me? What portion comes from brand name? What portion from styling? I get the package. You know who's obsessed with this? Accountants, because they want to break it up and short on balance sheets. Good luck with that, because I think it's an exercise in futurity, but they'll keep going. I haven't talked about Birkenstock yet. So now let's talk about Birkenstock. Before I talk about the company though, step back. It's a footwear company. I know it's a special footwear company, but it's a footwear company. It makes mostly sandals. So the first place I went was I went and looked at the footwear business. There are 86 publicly traded companies globally that are footwear companies. I took a look at how much their revenues were growing, how profitable they were, how much they were investing. And the picture I got was of an unattractive business. Why? Growth has been anemic. In fact, it's been negative for the last decade. Margins are not impressive, less than 7%. So he asked me, would you want to start a footwear company? The answer is probably not. But that's probably not a fair comparison because most of these footwear companies, and you can see it with the median revenues, are small companies with no recognizable brand name, struggling to stay afloat. So I looked at a second set of companies, which I think are more comparable to Birkenstock. I looked at the 12 largest footwear and apparel companies. I'm going to bundle them together because they share a lot of characteristics. Take a look at these 12 companies. At the top of the list, you've got LVMH and Hermes. Then you've got Nike, Christian Dior. You've got companies with brand names that are recognized pretty much around the world. Much larger companies. And these companies have much healthier numbers. Over the last decade, the compounded average, uh, annual growth rate in revenue is about 8.66%. Margins are impressive, 20 to 25%. And these companies, in a sense, are the companies I'm going to target when I look at valuing Birkenstock and ask the question, what's a reasonable number to use here? So now let's look at Birkenstock. I told you one of the big differences across companies is each company is so different from the previous one you valued. Instacart, when I valued it, was founded in 2012. There's no history there. Birkenstock was founded in 1774, 200, almost 250 years ago in, by a German cobbler. And it stayed a family business for much of its life. In fact, in the 19th century, it grew by selling its footwear to wealthy people who came to German spas, at that time a big growth business. But it stayed a family business, passed down from family member to family member. In the late, uh, late 1900s, 1896, they pioneered, they added flexible insults. And in 1902, they came to this revolutionary thought, nine side, it seems silly, that a, a footwear with arch support is gonna be more comfortable than one without but it stayed a relatively small company, a family-run business, making all of its shoes in Germany and selling them primarily in Germany. In 1963, it introduced its first sandal, the Madrid, which is still around, and it laid the foundation because sandals now are the heart of the Birkenstock product line. One of the interesting things about Birkenstock, and this is probably true for every company, but with Birkenstock, it's particularly noticeable, are these things that happen along the way. You know? And I'm going to call this serendipitous moments, things that, you know, you, when, when they happen, you say, how big a difference can it make that make a huge difference? In 1966, a, Calif uh, uh, a German-American, Marco Fraser, 
know, who lived in California, went back to Germany. And when she was back in Germany, she started complaining about foot pain. And one of the things Birkenstock had always marketed themselves on is comfort and foot health. And she tried some Birkenstocks on. She really liked them. And she went to Carl Birkenstock, who is the, you know, the, 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 found, the CEO of the company, then basically the owner and CEO. And he, she said, no, I'd like to take these sandals back to the U.S. and see if they will sell. I think they're really comfortable. He was reluctant, but he went along. In fact, it's rumored that he actually provided the capital to get us started in the U.S. and convince retailers to carry it. But it was a huge change for the company because you know, the shoes show up in primarily California stores and then you know, people who are rebellious, you know, rebelling against the war, against society, decided that this was not just comfortable, but it will set them apart from all those rule followers. It became, it's called the hippie sandal for that reason, is hippies wore them because they were comfortable. And then as the hippiedom leveled off, the growth leveled off, and then in 1990, uh, Kate Moss now a legendary, you know, um, model at that time, 16, for a cover story, was wore Birken, Birkenstocks on for that cover. And it took off again. It became, in, you know, a hot brand on college campuses again because young people wanted to rebel against those baby boomers who wore shoes and uncomfortable footwear. So we're going to show that. We come into the 21st century. And in the 21st century, we'll talk about what happened in 10 years ago. The company has kind of grown and evolved. Now, so if you look at where the company sits right now, I'm going to describe both the product line that the company has as well as its customers. Let's start with the products. You know? the Birkenstock offers a wide array of shoes, but its primary se sellers are three models of sandals. The Arizona, Madrid, and Giza, which are basically account for 50 to 55% of their sales. Yeah. The pricing is actually surprisingly modest because if you think about that list I showed you, Prada, LVMH, Hermes, you think, you know, $500 shoes. No, these shoes are actually about, a, you know, the most, uh, the most popular of the shoes. The Arizona sells for a little less than $100. I'm not saying that's cheap, but it's not exorbitantly expensive. There are some shoes sold by the company, by Birkenstock, which are thousands of dollars. They're usually shoes where Birkenstock has entered into a collaboration with a high-end designer like Dior. And Dior then produces, takes a traditional Birkenstock, maybe the Arizona sandal, and then does the Dior thing, you know, puts jewels on them, whatever, fur on the inside, and sells them for $1,500. Now, Birkenstock has about two dozen collaborations which produce Birkenstock modified shoes. But for the most part, the shoes are surprisingly modestly priced. And that reflects in the customers they have. It is true that Birkenstock has more female customers than male. 72% female, 28% male. And in terms of geography, Margot's attempt to bring it to the U.S. in the 1966 has clearly worked out. The U.S. is the biggest market for Birkenstock, 54%, followed by Europe. And the rest of the world drags along. I'm not sure Indians and Chinese would be good targets, but Birkenstock hasn't even really tried. The rest of the world is just 10%. In terms of age, it does tilt older. 61% of the people who own uh, Birkenstocks are either millennials or baby boomers, but a surprisingly large percentage are Gen X and Gen Z. It's a company with, you know, this is not 95% older people, 5% younger people. And in terms of income, I think is the most surprising number. It is true that 45% of the people buying Birkenstocks earn more than 100,000 a year. But it's also true that 20% of the people buying Birkenstocks earn less than 50,000 a year. It's a company with a product range centered around sandals with modest pricing for those sandals that draws on a diverse customer base. So now let's fill in the rest of the story. If you looked at Birkenstock in 2012, it was still a family run business with modest growth ambitions. And let's face it, that's why it might have survived as long as it did, because they didn't overreach. In 2012, as is often the case with family businesses, there was some internal strife within the family. And as a consequence, they decided to bring in outside managers and they chose two men, 
One was Marcus Bensberg, who was already a company veteran who'd been around, and a consultant for the company, Oliver Reichert, who really had no background in the footwear business as the other CEO. It was an act of genius in hindsight because the company's taken off since. If you look at the revenue since 2014, remember 2014, this was a small company, $250 million, $270 million in revenue. 270 million euros in revenues, those revenues have exploded to 1.4 billion by the time you get to 2023, the last 12 months leading into the IPO. The compounded annual growth rate in revenues over that decade has been 18.2%, and the growth has been particularly, particularly pronounced since COVID. There's a story going around that COVID made many people recognize, you know, on Zoom, no people can't see your feet. Why do you need to wear uncomfortable shoes? You could wear your Birkenstocks. Whatever the reason, revenues have exploded out of the box. And you've got to give the management credit. They've been opportunistic in seeking out growth, but they've done it with balance. Now, I talked about those collaborations. For every collaboration that Birkenstock entered into, it's rumored, we don't know for sure, that they turned away other companies, other designers, because they felt it didn't fit the image. This is growth with planning. It's not unabated growth, growth for the sake of growth. And it's growth that's been accompanied with profits. In this table, I look at key profit margin numbers, gross margin, operating margin, net margin. And if you look across the years, you can see that when you pay $100 for a Birkenstock, the cost of actually making that sandal is maybe 20, 25, 30, because the gross margin is 60%. The operating margins, the 20s, 22% jumped in 2022. The, you know, but I think it's steady state, 20 to 20, 20 to 25%. Remember we talked about brand name showing up in margin, the test of a, whether you have a brand name is look at the margin. Clearly it looks like Birkenstock is a brand name component. And the net margins are healthy as well. This is a growing company that's done so without sacrificing profit burning. Which brings us to a timing question. Why IPO now? There are two things I think driving it. One is this growth that they've had in the last three years and the profitability makes them well positioned to go public now. They're going on the wind behind them. It's, it, 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 that's one factor. There's another factor. And this is a part of the story I haven't told you yet. In 2021, a majority of the family sold a majority stake in the company to L. Carrington. You're saying, who the hell is L. Carrington? L. Carrington is a private equity firm. It's LVMH backed. LVMH, of course, the largest you know, brand name company in this space. So family sold a majority stake at an estimated pricing of 4 billion euros. That deal was funded substantially with debt, about 2 billion in debt. And that debt is still there. And you know, I think the private equity investors want to cash out and pay down the debt. So the timing makes sense. The first rumors of an IPO showed up about two months ago. The original pricing was about $6 billion. And every subsequent news story, the pricing keeps creeping up. $6 billion, $8 billion, $9 billion. We'll talk about why it might have crept up. But I understand why the company is going public now. Now, since I said this was going to be my vehicle to talk about intangibles, you're saying, what are the intangibles in Birkenstock? The first, of course, is a brand name. Even if you've never worn a Birkenstock or you, you know, bought one, you've heard of it, right? It's a company that has a brand name. And like all brand names, that brand name comes from a complex mix of things that you might not be able to ever replicate. The first is, it is unique footwear. You know, and I talk to people about Birkenstocks and ask them, what do you think about the shoe? You get one of two responses. It's the ugliest clog I've ever seen. Why would I wear that? Or it's like walking on air. This is the most comfortable thing I've ever worn. It certainly isn't a Me Too footwear. In a world full of footwear companies that try to look like everybody else, this is a company that makes truly unique footwear. It's also a company that's been incredibly consistent about the fact that its primary focus remains comfort and foot health. That was true in 200 years ago, 150 years ago, it still remains true today. And they act consistently on that. In what way? Their entire workforce is still in Germany. Think of how 
much pressure there must have been from Costco to saying, why don't you move your operations to some other part of the world where it's cheaper? They're still German based. They still use the ingredients that brought them here. They haven't found cheaper ingredients. And finally, this is a brand name which appeals to a very diverse customer base. You saw the mix of customers. So clearly there is a brand name component. Second, the history of Birkenstock is for whatever reason along the way it's attracted celebrities, high profile celebrities. I talked about Kate Moss in, the in 1990, but Gwyneth Paltrow, Heidi Klum, Paris Jackson, Kendall Jenner, ranging in age, young and old, you find celebrities wearing it. In fact, Steve Jobs wore Birkenstocks. His Birkenstocks recently were auctioned off at some absurdly high price. But here's the most amazing thing. I know that celebrity-driven marketing is big today, but Birkenstock doesn't pay these celebrities. They just wear it for free. They pay for the, it's the best kind of advertising is unsolicited. Birkenstock has mastered that game. So you've got brand name, you've got the celebrity customer base. Clearly, I mean, I'm a cynic when it comes to when somebody says this, the CEO is amazing. But in the case of Birkenstock, I think they did strike gold with Oliver Reichert because I mean, this, this might shift over time, but he's made the right choices over the last decade. The balance he maintains between growing the company and staying true to its brand name and mission. It's been impressive. Now, remember I said this company has had moments where luck hits it and it takes advantage. Talk about timing. This summer, the biggest movie around the world has been Barbie. And if you watch the movie with Margot Robbie, Robbie, who plays Barbie, sometime during the course of the movie, wears pink Birkenstock. It's created a surge in demand for Birkenstock sandals around the world. Now, talk about taking advantage of things that come unexpectedly. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to try to value Birkenstock. And I'm going to start by listing the inputs I'm going to use. I'm going to give you my justification, but I'm also going to talk about where the intangibles show up. Start with the growth component. It's at the stage. The company's had an impressive decade. Grown 18.2% a year, growing its revenues from 270 million to 1.4 billion. That's the good news. The bad news is you're now $1.4 billion company. Growing that 18% is going to be much more difficult to do. But I'm going to assume that the management team running the company now that's shown so much promise will be able to keep growth high, in this case, 15% a year. But in year one, I'm also going to give them what I call the Barbie buzz effect, which is given the surge in interest in the company, there's going to be a jump in demand this year. The nature of buzzes is they disappear. So it's not going to last beyond year one. But remember, many of those customers stay on your base. So this is actually an enduring effect. So the Barbie buzz and strong management is what's driving my growth assumptions. And as a, over the course of the next decade, I see revenues tripling for the company. You know, not quite tripling, but growing about 250% for the company from 1. Point, you know, from 1.4 billion to 4.6 billion. Actually tripling, tripling actually fits. So tripling over the next decade. Let's turn to margins. I talked about the brand name how it's been built up over time. I think it's enduring. It shows up as high margins today. I think that that brand name will persist and will allow margins to stay high. You know, the, 20, the margin in the most recent year was 22.3%. I'm gonna move it to 23% next year because of the Barbie buzz pushing up revenues. And over the next five years, that margin increases to 25%, which is not outlandish. If you think about it, that still puts them at the 75th percentile of brand name companies. Turn to reinvestment. Now, if you think about a company like company like Birkenstock to grow, you think about investing in your biggest asset, which is brand name. Usually, it's brand name advertising that you capitalize and treat as reinvestment. Here's where the celebrity buzz that they get, the celebrity push that they get, is going to, I think, help them. They get free celebrity ad advertising every time somebody will now wager this year for the Oscars there will be celebrities who win an Oscar who walk onto that stage with, a, with, a, with Birkenstocks on. And you're gonna see a jump in, in, in growth. The way this is gonna show up is they're gonna be able to get more revenues per, dollar, per, 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 per unit investment 
and I'm going to put them at the 75th percentile on that basis of assuming they'll get 2.62 euros per every euro invested. That's the 75th percentile. Just as a contrast, the median is about 1.59. So high growth, high margins, relatively little reinvestment. The cost of capital effects are muted. The fact that their factories are all in Germany makes them less exposed to country risk and supply chain risk. And the fact that they plan to use the billion euros they will raise in this offering to bring down debt is good news because it will make their cost of capital more stable. So cost of capital in euro terms is about 7.5%. There's no failure risk here. The competitive advantage they have collectively are enduring, so they learn more than the cost of capital. Every single input in this, store, in this, in this valuation comes from an intangible and the collective effect of these intangibles is I come up with a value for the equity of about $8.3 billion. 8.3 billion euros, I'm sorry, in euros. Now remember the most recent news story I said of the offering was 9.2 trillion. That's within shouting distance. You know, but with the intangibles built in. If you're trying to explain away the difference by saying, you know, it's because of the intangibles, I've already counted them. They're already in my 8.3 billion. Now, of course, you might push back and say, where? So here's what I did. I tried to take the four big intangibles and isolate the intangible and value just the effect of that intangible. You're saying, how do you do that? Let's take the Barbie buzz effect. The Barbie buzz shows up as higher revenue growth, 25% in year one, right? So I toggled it off. I said, what if I made it the same 15% I have in the next four years? I made it disappear. My value drops to 767 billion and the difference between the 8.3 billion and the 7.6 the 871 you know, million becomes the Barbie bus effect. The Barbie bus adds 871.56 million dollars, fill million euros to the value of the company. What about the celebrity, celebrity clientele? I said because they have a celebrity clientele that pushes their products without payment, I'm going to give them a high sales to cap ratio, 2.6 to third quarter. I removed that. I replaced it with the median, 1.59. Made them a more average company. That lowered the value further to 7.200, um, 7.2 billion. And if you look at the isolated effect, that's another 466 million because of the celebrity free advertising. He so said, what about good or great management? This was the toughest one. Because the question I'd ask is, what if Reichert hadn't come along? What if the company was still run by management picked by the handpicked by the family? Well, simplest way I could think of doing this was to say, look, I know what the compounded annual growth rate for a typical brand name company is about 8.66%. That's where they would be, making them a median company. The fact that they have a special management team means they can grow at 15%. The difference effect, and this is a huge one, is $5.13 billion. I'm sorry, so it's $2.07 billion. It's a difference that you get if you remove the growth effect, lower the growth rate from, from 15% to 8.66%. Then I made a final adjustment. I said, what if you lose your brand name? Remember, the brand name shows up in the operating margin, 23% next year, 25% beyond. I lowered that margin to the average, not across the brand name companies because they all have brand name, but the average across all apparel and footwear companies, 14.74%. Without a brand name, you're going to look like an average footwear company. That lowers the value further to $2.575 billion, which means that the brand name adds 2.55 billion euros to the value. I'm sorry, I keep saying dollars, but it's all euros. Now, here's another way to visualize how I did it. It's basically the waterfall chart. The base value, if I remove all of the intangibles for this company, is about 2.6 billion. Brand name adds the biggest chunk, 2 point, another 2.6 billion. Great management adds another 2.1 2, 2 billion. And then the Barbie buzz and the celebrity advertising they get for free add a little more value. Every single intangible has been separated out. Of course, these are based on my judgments for what that intangible brings in. And you should push back. In fact, we'll take great management. You might say, great management doesn't show up just in revenue growth. It shows up in the mix of debt and equity you have. The reinvestment you make. Good, let's debate that. That's a healthy debate about these intangibles. 
as opposed to this fuzzy is it good management is it not without ten, without things that you can point to that you can argue about it becomes a discussion about nothing so bottom line is at 8.3 billion dollars the value i'm within shouting distance of the 9.2 billion but it is it does look a little overvalued at the at the, at the suggested pricing now what will happen at the offering which should be in a in a week or two well remember ipos are price not valued i know by now you should recognize what, what the distinction between the two pricing is based on demand and supply values based on fundamentals which means what happens in the offering day will be determined in large part by the mood of the market on that day now let's break that mood down if you look at the mood about the company it's been building up i mean every story i've read about birkenstock has been a positive story oliver reichert has been raised to management sainthood he's presented as this amazing manager i mean it might be high but it's coming from not just the company or the bank it's coming from people who are presumably outsiders you add to that the barbie buzz i mean the company is riding a wave of good news the wind is at its in its, at its back the market mood has shifted in the middle of august it was incredibly positive now it's back to being negative today it was positive who knows what next week will bring at least for the moment that is my biggest concern is the market mood might be still sour in which case the 9.2 billion might be tough to sustain even with the norwegian fund being a cornerstone investor what am i going to do i've tried the arizona sandal somebody who gave it to me as a gift i didn't like it i mean it's you no know, it's it's not my thing so i'm unlikely to be a customer of the company but i could be an investor this is a unique company it's a small company but it's a unique company it's got a management team that maintains a delicate balance between using a brand name well and not overdoing it not the offering price of 45 to 50 euros per share it's 9.2 billion i'm not that interested it looks overvalued but if the market turns sour and the stock drops to 40 or 35 or 30 i'm not definitely consider being a buyer i hope you found the session useful and i thank you very much for listening